All right, if not, uh, we'll go ahead and get in, uh, uh, get involved in our study, but uh, first let's uh, go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. <clears throat> Grace Heavenly Father, we're thankful again for this beautiful day. We're thankful for the privilege we've had already to assemble and to worship Thee, the only living and true God, and we're thankful for this opportunity we have to come back and, and to be together, to have fellowship with one another, to encourage one another, and to open up uh, Your Word and to study things that are are pertinent to uh, our lives and to the lives of those that are around about us. Father, we're mindful, uh, particularly thinking about our study tonight, well, we're, we're mindful of the, the course of our nation and the course of our state. Uh, we pray that our elected leaders will uh, do those things that are in the best interest of, of all the citizens, uh, that they might rule in a way uh, that is pleasing to you. Uh, that, uh, that justifies their existence and upholds the principles uh, for which you have uh, given a government. Father, we're thankful that uh, uh, Ronnie is well. We're thankful uh, that Philip and Wade are able to be there to get him. Uh, we ask your blessings on them as they, uh, as they get him and as they uh, come home. We ask your blessings as, on them as they travel home. And we pray that you'll keep them safe. Father, watch over all of us, keep us, and forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right, um, I put on the Facebook page, this is, this is not what I intended to address. I, had a, I still have a list of questions um, from our uh, website and, and, and our, our text, our, our uh, Google Voice and uh, things like that. Um, but uh, on, on um, I guess it was on, th on Thursday, uh, a bill was introduced into the Alabama Senate uh, which is uh, by design to given to expand casino gambling in the state of Alabama. Now, I don't know if any of you have noticed, but there have been a number of commercials just out of the blue. All of a sudden, we get a bunch of commercials about the Porch Creek Indians. You know, most people never even heard of the Porch Creek Indians. And now, all of a sudden, we got commercials all over the airwaves on the Porch Creek Indians. Well, let me just tell you. They are laying the foundation to expand gambling because the Porch Creek Indians conduct casinos and whatnot in the, in the state of Alabama. And so I have seen the particulars of the bill that uh, was submitted, and uh, it, is, it is one of the most corrupt things I have ever seen in my life. Uh, the provisions that, that they're talking about making to expand gambling uh, basically, they're going to take bids. Here, now, here, now, here's how corrupt it is. Okay, they're going to take bids. They're going to take bids on who wants to take over gambling in certain parts of the state, like perhaps Mobile or four or five different areas around the state. But the Porch Creek Indians get the last bid. That's right. They get the last bid. No matter who, no matter what anybody bids to, to explain this game, the Porch Creek Indians and other, uh, uh, they, they get the last bid. So it's really not open bidding. It's just how high can they drive up the price on the Porch Creek Indians. But that's how, that's how corrupt even this industry is. Uh, and, uh, and so, um, and there's also, I think there's provision, I'm not sure, but I think there's provision for the lottery in this particular bill. Um, but in, in any event, uh, you know, back in 1999, when uh, Don Siegelman was elected governor, he ran on being the pro-lottery candidate, and he got elected, and then we had the lottery vote, and we voted it down. And here we are, it's, you know, 23 days later, or 23 years later, you know, we're facing, uh, we're facing uh, many of these same issues again. And, you know, these are just things that, that uh, they are not, it's not going to go away. If, if we're able to win this time around, it will raise its head again. Um, and so um, I just want to give us, some, give us some tools because I think there are a lot of good people, and, and I mean this sincerely, I think there are a lot of good people that don't see the harm in it. Uh, there are probably a lot of people who would never participate in it but would say kind of you know, live and let live. In other words, if, if, if that's what people want, then that's what you know. That's what we ought to you know. That's what we ought to do, and they don't really realize. They don't understand the damage that gambling creates and causes in in communities and in states. Um, 
And like I said, the, the, whole, the whole industry is entirely corrupt. I mean, it's morally bankrupt. The people that run it are corrupt. Um, and, and, and as a general rule, and I hate to say this, you know, but a lot of the politicians that are in bed with the gambling uh, groups, they're corrupt. Uh, you know, they passed, they passed gambling in my home state of Missouri about 30 or 40 years ago. The lottery and, and riverboat casino. Well, here's what they told us. It's all for the kids. It's all for education to help the kids. And so guess what happened? They passed it. And I'm just going to pull a number out of the air, okay? I don't know if this is the number or not. But like in the first year, gambling created... $200 million for the education uh, fund in the state of Missouri. But guess what the legislators did? They cut $200 million out of the fund and made up for it with $200 million in gambling money, which means gambling contributed how much to education? Zero. Zero. And so, again, that's the, kind, that's the kind of mindset, the kind of people that you deal with in these types uh, of situations. Now, I'm just going to look at, uh, I'm going to look at, one of them is obviously a lot more lengthy than the other, but uh, um, first of all, and then I'll conclude with some passages uh, concerning what the Bible says, but, uh, because a lot of people that might promote it, uh, really don't care what the Bible says. But some people that don't care about what the Bible says can be, can be reasoned with, for example, on financial grounds or, or you know, just societal problems. But, uh, but I'll make mention of this just right off the start, that, that gambling is a sin even if it's legal. You know, in other words, legalizing gambling, legalizing the, the lottery will not make it un, not sinful just because it is legal. You know, there are a lot of things in our country that are legal that are sinful. You know, abortion is legal. Abortion is sinful. Uh, when I was in Nevada about six or seven, eight years ago holding a meeting in Pahrump, uh, there, are, there were two brothels in Pahrump, Nevada. Prostitution, legal. <laughs> that doesn't make it right. Uh, so, you know, there are any number of things we could think about that, that are legal that are still, uh, think about all, you know, think about where all uh, 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 marijuana is legalized. You know, all the states where marijuana is legalized. Or you could even say alcohol. You know, just because it's legal to buy alcohol doesn't mean it's not sinful to use alcohol. And so the legality of a thing has no, has no effect on, if it's sinful, it's sinful. Okay? If it's sinful, it's sinful regardless of what the law says. Um, and just by, as an aside. By statute, by law, raffles are illegal in the state of Alabama because they fit in the same category as lotteries. And so raffles are also illegal. And yet, schools and churches participate in raffles. Uh, fire departments participate, conduct raffles. They're illegal. Now, the state turns, you know, the state turns a blind eye to it and, and doesn't enforce that law, uh, but raffles are illegal. Raffles are a form of gambling. And so, you know, those things are illegal. Um, uh, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 8, the idea that, that we can do wrong for a good reason. You know, Paul said that it was slanderously reported of them, let us do evil that good may come. And Paul, again, Paul described that as a slanderous report. In other words, Paul never said it's all right to do wrong as long as you have good intentions or you think good will come out of doing wrong. And so, and so, you know, whatever, you know, whatever they say about, you know, it's going to create more jobs. It's going to create more revenue for schools. It's going to do this. It's going to do that. None of those things matter because it is never right to do wrong. And so gambling, uh, uh, gambling is sinful even though it's legal uh, or for a what so-called good cause. Now, with regard to the societal in, uh, effects of gambling, I've got a number of things here uh, that need to be considered. Uh, number one is uh, gambling is addictive, and nobody will deny that. In fact, in, in many states where gambling is legal, particularly the lottery, there is a percentage of the lottery revenue that has to be set aside to treat people who are gambling addicts. 
Now, think about that. Certain percentage of, of the total amount of revenue has to be set aside to treat people that become addicted because of that, because of that thing. And so, uh, so gambling by its very, and, I'm on, and I, I'll get to a couple other things later that show how addictive gambling uh, really is. But here's just a few things with regard to uh, addiction. University of Connecticut study, one in 20 youth between the ages of 12 and 17 exhibit behavior indicative of problem gambling. In other words, one in 20 youth in the state of Connecticut exhibit problem gambling uh, um, characteristics or, or, or uh, behavioral problems. Now you, you think about that. I mean, that's, that's an, you know, one in 20, that's five out of 100. And that's, you know, that's a, an, an unbelievable number. Uh, a New York State study from 2006 to 2008 showed that 140,000 adolescents had gambling problems. That was 10%, one in 10. 140,000 adolescents were gambling addicts, had addictive behaviors uh, due uh, to gambling. Uh, now this is an older study, but I'm sure the numbers are not any better now than they were then. 1996 Connecticut Council on Problem Ga Gambling surveyed 4,000 students in five high schools. All right, here's what the survey revealed. 87% of respondents had gambled for money at some time. 87% out of 4,000 had gambled for money at some time. 32% of them had played the lottery, even though the age for the lottery is 18. One third of all kids under the age of 18, from 12 to 17, one third had played the lottery. Uh, 1993, uh, 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 Daniel Hand High School in Madison, Connecticut, the police busted a gambling ring in that high school after one student reported he had lost $20,000 to a 17-year-old bookie. $20,000. A kid in high school had lost $20,000. Teen gambling contributes to credit card fraud, theft, drug running, and prostitution to keep up gambling habits. And that's the kind of effect that gambling has you know, on young people. In the state of Texas, 70% of, 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 of gambling addicts who seek professional help cite the lottery as their primary source of their problem. The lottery. You know, not to, it's not the guy at the roulette table. It's not the guy throwing dice. It's the guy down at the 7-Eleven you know, it's, it's buying scratch-offs. 70% of problem gamblers in Texas cited the lottery as, uh, as uh, their main source of gambling uh, difficulty. Um, money spent on gambling in the United States is greater than the money spent on spectator sports, movies, music, video games, and theme parks combined. You think about that. Because every, you know, every Saturday at Auburn, Alabama, Knoxville, LSU, 80, 90, 100,000, Athens, Georgia. I mean, you think, about, you think about the number of people that occupy college football stadiums on any given Saturday and pro football stadiums and baseball stadiums and, and uh, hockey arenas, gambling how many people go to the movies? How many people rent video games? You total up all of those, all of those entertainment aspects and gambling, more money is spent on gambling than all of those things uh, combined. Uh, gambling contributes to crime. I don't think anybody with, with sense would argue that. That where you have gambling, you're going to have more crime. Now, I don't have a citation for this, and, and it's an older statistic, but it said eight months after casinos opened in Gulfport, Mississippi, murder increased by 75%, rape by 200%, robbery by 300%, assaults by 64%, burglary by 100%, auto theft by 160%, and, 
And property crime in Gulfport is two times the national average. So that gives you an idea. Uh, Tunica, Mississippi rates in the lowest 5% of all cities in Mississippi on matters of safety. Now, let me give you this. This is interesting. And I'm going to tell you, listen, Tunica is, is on its way out. Tunica is dying. Right? It's only been 30 years since they legalized gambling in Tunica. 30 years. And the city's already dying. All right? But you know, the statistic that Tunica is in the bottom 5% of all Mississippi cities in the matter of being safe with regard to crime, they just opened a gambling uh, facility in, West, I believe it's in West Memphis, Arkansas. Just across the river from Memphis. By the way, if you don't know where Tunica is, it's 30 miles out of Memphis, right down the Mississippi River, okay? So it's, it's a, a half hour out of Memphis. West Memphis is right across the river. You can see West Memphis from the Bass Pro Shop, whatever. You know, when you cross the bridge, you're in West Memphis. Arkansas has been running advertising, warning people not to drive to Tunica to gamble because it's too risky and encouraging them to stay in, Al stay in Arkansas and gamble. Now, I read that on a, that's on a casino website. That one casino group is advertising against another casino group saying that it's not safe to... It's a, and here was the, the ad campaign was, don't risk the drive. Don't risk the drive. Stay out of Tunica, Mississippi. And then... And by the way, Tunica got to hollering about it, and then they had to have a meeting about it. Of course, there's nothing they can do about it. As they'll say, as Ben Shapiro says, facts are not concerned with your feelings. And facts are facts. And so you have one gambling group advertising against another gambling group because the city of Tunica is not, is not a safe place, not a safe place uh, to be. Uh, gambling contributes to poverty and bankruptcy. Um, the number of New Mexico households living below the poverty line jumped 25% in the first two years after casinos were introduced. Bankruptcies are higher in counties with the lottery than those without, and 23% uh, uh, higher in counties with casinos. In other words, wherever you have the lottery, you have a higher bankruptcy rate, and if you have casinos, you have an even higher bankruptcy rate uh, than in counties uh, without uh, those things. Found this statistic today. Uni University of Nevada, Las Vegas, a seat was called a CDC Nevada study. They started keeping statistics on suicide in Nevada in 1929. Okay? In 1929. In the 93 years that they've been tracking suicide in the state of Nevada, Nevada has a suicide rate which is two to three times the national average. Two to three times. Now, what, you know, what was going on in Nevada in 1929 that wasn't going on anywhere else in the country? You know, Las Vegas was the only place in America where you could gamble until about 1980 or so when Atlantic City started allowing gambling, all right? So, so all those years, by the way, they like to brag now that their suicide rate is lower. It's still twice the national average, but it's not three times the national average. Now, think about this. What might be the reason for that? What might be the reason that Nevada's suicide rate is still twice the national average, but is no longer three times the national average? Because you can gamble in other places. That's exactly right. Their youth suicide rate is two to three times, ages 12 to 17 in Nevada. I mean, across the board, suicide rate two to three times the national average in the state of Nevada. And again, it's only and it's lower in recent years since about by the way, 1990 was the year when it really started kind of falling off for them, and that was about the time you had Atlantic City and Tunica. By the way, at one time, well, I guess even now, 
Tunica was the third largest gambling mecca in America behind Las Vegas and Atlantic City. Tunica, Mississippi was the third largest gambling mecca in the United States after Las Vegas and Atlantic City. By the way, this also came from this Nevada website. Their suicide rate is two to three times the national average. That same study said that only one in 25 suicide attempts is successful. One in 25. What does that tell you? That means that at least, I don't, know what, I don't know what the suicide attempt rate is in other states, but I can only assume that it's probably not as high as it is in Nevada. But if the suicide rate's three times, and one in 25 are, only one in 25 are successful, that's an astronomical, you know, that's a, that's a rate of, well, their suicide rate is over 20 people per 100,000, so you multiply that by 25, that's 400 people per 20,000 attempt suicide in any given year in Las, in Las Vegas, or in the bottom. That's, a, that's, a, that's an astronomical number. You know, and there, and there's, one, you know, there's one consistency to this whole thing, and it is the matter of gambling. Um, gambling also preys on those who can least afford it. All right? I found this statement. I, I'd heard it before. It says, the lottery is a tax on people who are bad at math. <laughs> the lottery is a tax on people who are bad at math. Now listen to this, y'all. And by the way, the numbers that I found recently still match the numbers I found 20 years ago when I preached on gambling in, in 2000 when Siegelman you know, put, it on the, put it on the docket, all right? The numbers still hold. Nationally, not nationally, all right? Where the average household income is less than $20,000, the entire household income, where the entire household income is less than $20,000, $550 is spent on the lottery every year. Households that make less than $20,000 a year spend $550 a year gambling on the lottery. Households where the income is thirty to fifty thousand dollars, spend two hundred and eighty-eight dollars a year in gambling. What do we see? No, we see as income rises. We'll say as income doubles, the amount spent on the lottery does what? Gets cut in half. Which means, whereas you would think it would be two times higher, it's half. Why? Because people that make that kind of money. They work, yeah, they work for it. Guess what? In households above $50,000, less than $100 a year is spent on the lottery. So, did you hear what he said? Selling false hope to the desperate. A New York lottery, New York lottery ad said, all you need is a dollar and a dream. Now, if you think that's bad, they put billboards in Chicago slums with a picture of the lottery ticket that said, this could be your ticket out. This could be your ticket out. Now, Nash, again, here's again, nationally speaking, people making less than $10,000 a year spend more than $500 on lottery tickets. Now, by the way, I got this statistic from Vox, and Vox is a far-left publication. Far, far-left publication. I mean, it's way out there. I mean, I mean, they make the New York Times look conservative, all right? Here's what I found in Vox. This is from 2016. People making less than $10,000 a year spend $597 on lottery tickets. Blacks spend five times more than whites. 
blacks spend five times more than whites on lottery tickets. You know why? Because they are targeting poor black neighborhoods to sell lottery tickets. By the way, you can look at the numbers in Georgia. Uh, by the way, in, uh, uh, in Highland Park, Maryland, in Highland, I believe it's Highland Park, Maryland. I, I don't have this one in front of me. It's on one of my older documents. Um, the average household income was less than $35,000 a year. And the amount spent on the lottery was higher in that county than every other county in, in Maryland. In, in, pure, in pure numbers, more money spent in a, in a county with that averaged less than $35,000 a year household income. More spent on the lottery. Um, also, here's from, uh, here's from the, uh, Connecticut, also 2016, also from Vox. And... and this, this points to the addictive nature of gambling, okay? And I saw the graph, and I just copied a little bit of this, all right? In, in Connecticut, $1.1 billion a year is spent on gambling in the state of Connecticut. $1.1 billion. 80%, that is $901 billion. $901 million, I'm sorry, $901 million out of $1.1 billion is spent on scratch-off and daily drawings. Less than $40 billion is spent on the Powerball, the mega million. In other words, you know, you know the big ones that pay $100 million, $200 million, $300 million, you know, they, they build up, you know, the giant, jack, the giant jackpots are not worth are not where the people are spending their money. They're spending their money on the scratch-offs. Why? Because it pays out more often. Somebody walks up there and buys 10 scratch-offs, they might win five bucks. By the way, Rhonda and I have seen this a million times in St. Louis in the, in the uh, gas stations and whatnot. You walk in there and you can't even pay for, you can't even pay for a Coke because some, and I'll just use the term, some idiot is standing there buying scratch-offs. And what does he do? He scratches them off while he's standing right there, blocking up the, blocking up the, the cash register. And then if he wins, guess what he does? He buys more scratch-offs. But it goes to the addictive nature of gambling. That, that people who are gambling addicts are not spending their money on the giant payoffs, they need that fix. They need that little scratch-off fix, that, that, daily, that daily fix. By the way, Connecticut is fixing to add another level of gambling called Keno, where a winner is drawn every five minutes. Every five minutes. So... It, 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 it points to the idea that when people are addicted to gambling, they got, it's just like drugs. They got to they gotta have it. They got to have it. You know, it's not like I got to get a whole pile of drugs in me. I just need to get something in me. Just tide me over till the, you know, till the next time. Um, during the 2008 recession, 42 out, uh, excuse me, 25 out of 42 states saw spikes in lottery sales. In other words, when more people were out of work, more people had less money to spend, lottery sales went up in 25 out of 42 states. Now here's one's going, this one's going to kill you. In a nationwide interview or survey of millennials, by the way, millennials are people aged 20 to 40, right? Age 20 to 40. In a nationwide survey of millennials, 15% of millennials cited the lottery as their primary retirement plan. Fifteen percent of people aged 20 to 40 cited the lottery as their primary retirement plan. Now, what is the uh, 
What is the comparison about your odds to win the lottery? You're more likely to be what? What is it? You're more likely to be what than win the lottery? Struck by lightning. Everybody knows it. You're more likely to be struck by lightning than to win the lottery. And yet, 15% of people aged 20 to 40 are counting on the lottery as their retirement plan. Also this, the state of Connecticut released a list, a demographic list, of 21 years of lottery winners. All right, 21 years of winners. And here's what, here's what the majority of the winners, living below the poverty line, minority. 21 years of lottery winners in the state of Connecticut. Almost all living below the poverty line, almost all minorities. And when you say minorities, just read the word black. Don't tell me, don't tell me that they are not preying on people who are in desperate situations. Look, if everybody played the lottery, I mean, look, I mean, I mean, let's just be honest. How many black folks are there in Connecticut? I mean, Connecticut don't look like Mississippi you know, or Alabama, right? It doesn't look, you know, you know that, part of, that, that part of our country is, is, is wider than about anywhere else in the world. All right? So how is it then in a state that is disproportionately white has a massively disproportionate number of black poor lottery winners? Dumb luck? Or who's spending all the money on the lottery? You see? Lottery, the lottery preys on people. And by the way, this is another thing you got to think about. When people lose everything in the lottery, who's, where are they going to go? Where are they going to go? Who are they going to call for help? <coughs> Welfare and where, and where else? Churches. Churches. And so, you know, this, I mean... And I say that to say this. I, obviously, I would hope that none of us would ever participate in gambling. But even if we don't participate, it doesn't mean we are not affected. Our communities are affected. You know, even our budgets can be, our budgets can be affected. And let me just add this one more thing before I move on to, the, uh, move on to one more uh, item about Tunica. Let me add this one more thing. Uh, 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 Where does that money come from that goes to the lottery? Yeah. The people that play. But we're, for example, people that play the lottery, people that go to, to Tunica and play in the casinos. I mean, one, it's disposable income, right? Disposable income. But for many, it's not disposable income. But let's just say, let, uh, let's just say this. Let's just say that nobody gambled beyond their disposable income. Y'all know what disposable income is, right? It's money you have after you pay all your bills. In other words, it's money that you get to spend as you see fit. When you've paid your mortgage, your rent, your car payment, all your bought all your groceries, whatever you have left is called disposable income. You spend it how you want. Let's just say that nobody spent anything beyond disposable income on the lottery or gambling. What does that do to, let's just say, what does that do to stores like Saul and Gold Jewelers? What does that do to Butter Hatchie Outfitters? What does that do to Sassy Frass? In other words, if, if people are spending their disposable income on gambling, they are not spending it at the local clothing store. They are not spending it at the local jewelry store. You know, they're not spending it locally at all. 
Which also means, then, then what else suffers when that happens? Tax base gets eroded. And when the tax base gets eroded, who gets affected? Everybody, but particularly what? Schools. Schools that depend, that depend on local tax base. Oh, man. Yes, some of, the, some of the demographic numbers were incredible against the elderly. Listen, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. And this, this, actually happened. this actually happened in Marion County. That I know a family that, had, that was living in a rental house that did not have running water and they had kids living in that house. Okay? Had kids living in the house did not have running water. They weren't obviously they weren't on the city system or the county system, all right? But they couldn't call their landlord to come fix the water. You know why? Because they were behind in their rent and at the time we discovered they didn't have water, we also discovered they had taken their tax return and gone to Tunica. Got a house with kids in it. In the middle of winter, no running water, behind on their rent, can't call the landlord because they've taken their tax return and headed to Tunica. That, that happened in this county. It happened. Because I can take you to the house, all right? You know, and in the work that Lisa does and, and others do, I mean, the, the people that probably come in and see Jeff on a regular basis, you know, how many of those people that come into community action are, are people that are, you know, they're tapped out because, by the way, did you know that the month of February is the biggest month for gambling? Did you know that? The month of February is the biggest month for, for gambling revenue because why? People get their tax refund. They get their tax refund. They go down somewhere <laughs> and, they get, and they give somebody an outrageous amount to get their money today. You know, and I'm not going to call any names of these places, but they're basically all the same. If you're going to get $1,500 back on your tax refund, they'll give you $1,100 back to do your taxes if you'll take the 1100 today as opposed to wait six weeks and get 1500 By the way, happens by the thousands every day in our communities. I mean, it's happening, it's happening right now even as we speak. And what are those people who've got to have their money today? What are many of them doing? Go west, young man. Headed to Tunica. Online gambling, sports betting is making its way into a lot of different states. Now, here's the tale of Tunica, okay? The tale of Tunica. Harris, which is owned by, uh, ended up by Caesars Entertainment. By the way, at one time in the mid-2010s, Caesars was $23 billion in debt. Caesars. $23 billion in debt, all right? Harris and Tunica closed. You know why? Too much competition. They couldn't stay open. Roadhouse Casino Tunica closed February 2019. Why? Too much competition. Employment in the, in the heyday, all right? In the heyday of Tunica in the late 90s, Early 2000s, there were 13,000 jobs related to the gambling industry in Tunica, Mississippi. 13,000. Today, 4,000. More than 30% of people that live in that county live below the poverty line. Gambling revenue in Tunica, 2006, 1.2 billion. 2013, 770 million. 2016, 630 million. 2019, 580 million. Do you see which direction this seems to be going? 
They lost 60% of their gambling revenue from 2006 to 2019. And if you drive over there right now, and I'm sure Zach's probably been over with, with, the, with the shows and stuff that they have with the, with the uh, uh, mobile ministry, those buildings are just sitting empty. Massive parking lots with grass growing up in the cracks and, and buildings sitting empty. Harris can't sell their building. It's got a 2,500-seat arena, a golf course, 45,000 square feet of, of, of floor space. They can't even sell it. Who could buy something like that? They can't. No, no, in other words, what industry could come in and buy that property and use it and put people back to work? Only the gambling industry. But the gambling industry is moving out, not moving in. You know, Tunica, you know, like I said, Tunica is on it. It's on its way. It's on its way out. Uh, and so, those are just some of the practical aspects. Now, ma'am. Right. Yeah. In Missouri, the first thing they passed was riverboat gambling. Right. Uh, uh, one of the gambling industries spent $40 million remodeling the president. The president was a uh, riverboat uh, in St. Louis. They spent $40 million by, before gambling was ever passed in the state of Missouri. They bought that boat and spent $40 million renovating it. What's that tell you? All right, but then they started building them on barges that didn't go anywhere. They didn't run up and down the river. So that they had them a loophole in the riverboat park. They built them on barges on the river. And nobody, you know, nobody shut them down. Nobody shut them down. All right, now, uh, gambling, uh, gambling is sinful on a, number, on a number of reasons. Number one, gambling violates the golden rule. You know, people that gamble want other people to lose their money so that they can have their money. Right? You know, somebody has to lose in order for somebody to win. You know, if somebody puts a dollar in a slot machine and pulls the handle and they win a million dollars, what does that mean? It means that over a million dollars has been lost by other people in order for them to win. And by the way, the, the, you know, you know, those things don't pay 100%. You know, they don't build those. They don't build those buildings out of the goodness of their heart. You know, they build those. They build those giant edifices with your money, or people's money. Uh, gambling prohibits or violates God's law prohibiting covetousness. You know, to covet what belongs uh, to another. Uh, it violates God's law to provide things honest in the sight. Of all men. Gambling is the number one source of revenue for organized crime. We already talked about the, you know, the effects or the, the affiliations of gambling uh, with crime. Gambling violates Galatians 6 and verse 10. Let us do good unto all men. Gambling violates 1 Peter 4 and verse 10 in the command to be good stewards of our money. Gambling violates the command to follow the example of Christ, 1 Peter 2 and verse 21. You know, can anybody picture Jesus sitting at a one-armed bandit? By the way, you don't even have to pull the, you don't even have to pull the arm anymore. They get, people got so lazy now, they won't pull the arm. All you got to do is just put your money in and push a button. You don't, don't even have to pull the arm anymore. But can anybody imagine Jesus sitting sitting in front of a one-armed bandit? Somebody imagine Jesus sit, standing around a roulette table, a dice table, you know, five, you know, Texas Hold'em table. You know, if I can't, you know, if I can't picture Jesus doing it, <laughs> then it's probably a really good. It's probably a really good reason for me uh, not to do it. Gambling violates every God-approved means of obtaining money. By the way, there are a lot of different ways to get money. A lot of different ways to get money. Um, obviously, work. D does the Bible endorse work? If a man will not work, neither let him eat. Second uh, Thessalonians 3 and verse 10. Didn't God give Adam a job? 
tend the garden. Even when he lived in the Garden of Eden, he still had to work to some degree. And then it's, he got, of course, it got harder when he got kicked out. But God has always endorsed work as a man. Uh, Ephesians 4.28, let him that stole steal no more. Rather, let him work with his hands that he might provide to someone or those who have or are in need. Uh, the selling of your personal goods is a God-ordained means of getting money. For example, uh, 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 Barnabas sold a piece of land, Acts chapter 4, took the money and brought it uh, to the apostles' feet. Ananias and Sapphira did the same thing, and they would have been, they would have been blessed for it if they hadn't lied about it. What did Peter say? When it was in your possession, was it not yours to do with as you please? And after you sold it, was not the money yours to do with as you please? So the selling of personal goods is certainly, uh, certainly a worthy means of, uh, of obtaining uh, money or income. Inheritance, the parable of the prodigal son in Luke, in Luke 15. And by the way, we read a lot of accounts in the Bible about inheritance, right? Some get double portion. Esau sold his birthright, you know, to, to uh, uh, Jacob. You know, as Johnny Ramsey used to say, the high price of a bowl of soup. Uh, you know, but inheritance is an honorable way. It's an honorable way to, to make uh, or to receive income. Interest on investment. Interest on investment is an honorable way. Uh, uh, for example, when in the parable of the talents... What did, what, did the, what did the master say? What did the master say to the lazy servant who hid the money? He said, at the very least, you should have done what? Put it in the bank so that I could have earned money, interest on that money. But, but by extension, how would no, it's, but by extension, how does the bank pay you interest on your money? By using it to help somebody else make money. Right? So the bank takes your money and invests it in order that they can at least pay you some kind of rate of return on your money. And so investment, which by the way, we need to make something clear here real quick. Risk is not gambling. Okay? Risk does not equal gambling. All right? Farming is a risk, right? But it's not gambling. All right, so why why doesn't why doesn't farming equate to why doesn't farming equate to gambling with regard to risk versus gambling? Because somebody doesn't have to lose for you to make money. Somebody doesn't have to lose. That's right. When when you when you invest and you put your money in in fertilizer and seed and equipment, it's a risk. But nobody has to lose in order for you to succeed, right? Starting your own business is a risk. I mean, there are, there are any number of things that are risk. Investing in the stock market is a risk. But it's not gambling because when you invest, you're giving people money. You're giving people money to succeed so that you in turn can succeed. In other words, you're helping people succeed. You're not gambling. When you invest, let's just say you invest in Apple, Apple uh, or some stock. You know, somebody doesn't have to lose in order for Apple to make money, right? In other words, Apple doesn't win at somebody else's expense. Therefore, it's not risk is not the same thing uh, as as gambling. Uh, and then this, just a, a free will gift. <laughs> You know, people people can receive free will free will gifts. Um, you know, somebody you know somebody might somebody might die, and you have no you have no reason or expectation of receiving anything, but somebody could leave you something, or somebody could just give you something. Now, I've seen a number of Christians that uh, in various times have struggled for various reasons, and Christians of uh, of financial means just. Give them gifts. I mean, I know of at least I know of at least two or three situations where one Christian, just out of the goodness of his heart, gave between twenty five and fifty thousand dollars to another person to help them when when they were in time of need. And there's nothing nothing in the world wrong with that. It's a it's a, it's a free will gift. It's an offering. 
with no expectation of anything in return. But gambling is none of those things. Now, there may be some other ways of getting money that I've omit, I haven't thought of, but those are, those are the five that, I, that I've thought of uh, that are honorable means of, of, of getting, uh, getting money, all right? And gambling doesn't fit any of those. And so uh, any questions about any of this? Christians, and, and by the way, I put this, when I put this in the description, I didn't say why Christians should oppose gambling. The title of this is why Christians must oppose gambling. You know, Christi it's not that Christians should oppose abortion. Christians must oppose abortion. Christians must oppose gambling because it violates so many principles that are found in the Bible. Now again, not to mention just the societal decay, degradation, and destruction uh, that's left uh, in, uh, in the path. Now let me just say this about the state of Alabama and, and the, gambling, the gambling matter. If Tunica is on its way out because there's too many places already to gamble, and there's places already to gamble on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi, why does anybody think that putting a casino in Mobile, in Mobile County is going to solve Alabama's financial problems? In other words, you know, the, the more places there are to gambling, the more or the smaller the pieces of the pie are for everybody else. And again, even if you could tell me that gambling would bring $10 billion a year to the state of Alabama, it'd still be wrong and I'd still oppose it. I'd still oppose. If you could tell me that gambling would let us build brand new school buildings all across the state and give kids free education, still got to be opposed. Still got to be opposed. You know, you know, would, you, would you vote for the legalization of cocaine and heroin? Would you, vote, would you legalize that if you could raise a little money for the school? Or would you have enough sense to know what those types of things do to individuals and to families and whatnot? Gambling is ga gambling's no different. No different. All right, any questions, thoughts, comments, as Bobby would say? Questions, comments, or smart remarks? Well, I think if... Um, is this a question, comment, or a smart remark? Smart remark. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that uh, it's supposed to... Uh, in one way, it's profit in the state of Alabama, but it's not going to... It's just going to make matters more... Sure. Sure. There, there's, no, there's no ultimate good for it. Especially the violent ways that people get when they have too much money. Yep. All right. Hugh Ellis, I know I didn't call on you earlier, but would you dismiss us tonight? Yes. If you would be, be on your feet, Hugh Ellis, and dismiss us with a word of prayer.